Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. reconciling God. We confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, Renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because lo God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. 
from above and for salvation let us pray to the Lord Lord and for the peace of the whole world for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord Lord For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord and mercy, help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 20, verse 7 through 13. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around. Denounce him, let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. The second reading is from the sixth chapter of Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For, for whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So that also you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here ends the reading. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 24 through 39. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and a slave to be like the master. They have called the master of the house Beelzebul. How much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell it in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's old household. Whoever loves father or more, mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, are we having fun yet? Now, before some of you get all in a twist, you should know that I did not pick these texts for today. With every fiber of my being, I would love to be coming to you today with sugar and spice rather than some of the bitterness that is in this text. I would rather spend the morning waxing poetic about the God of love who comforts us, restores us, heals us. And I would probably rather focus on the microcosm in which I live, the realm in which I have at least a little bit of a semblance of control, even if it's not really true. But instead we get this text. It's divisive, it's disturbing, it's political, and it's a bit revolutionary. Try as I might, I could not find a gentle way through this text because it is divisive, it is disturbing, it's political, and it is revolutionary. 
In fact, you all know that this is part of Jesus' larger missionary speech, the speech where he is looking for laborers for the harvest, the speech where they are to pack lightly, where they are to shake off the dust wherever they are not welcomed. Yeah, because Jesus knew that what he was talking about was not popular. He knew that what he was talking about was going against the status quo. It was flying in the face of what the acceptable narrative of the day was. So let's talk a little bit about what the acceptable narrative of the day was. The narrative at that time was one of an agrarian society, one in which 25% of the elite, or the richest of the population, lived off of the production and the backs of the 75% of the peasant class. What was different with this agrarian society than ones that had come before was that it was commercialized. The elite didn't just take the surplus off the peasants, they took the land as well, leaving them without control. So things were quite out of balance at that time. And when things are out of balance, God always finds a way to lift a prophetic voice. So prophets had been active in Israel from the earliest times, and they were seen as interpreters of the Torah. The rise in, of prophecy and of prophetic literature became, came with economic and social development. So particularly we see this as the development of the two kingdoms come along, uh, Judy, Judah and Israel, and they develop these oppressed lower classes. Most of the prophets criticized the direction in which the people were being led by their rulers, and this often got them into quite a bit of trouble. They were met with hostility, with ridicule, with mistreatment, punishment, and exile. The word prophet means to speak for, and the prophet spoke for God to the people, receiving God's message through visions, through dreams. The prophetic message varied with the circumstances, and when things were going well, the prophets warned the people about impending doom if they did not change their ways. When things were going badly, they supported the people with words of encouragement and hope. And the role of the prophet was never, ever easy. Hence our reading for today from Jeremiah this morning. Go back and look at it, and you'll understand what I mean. Once again, a prophetic voice enters the scene. And no, it's not Jesus. It's actually John the Baptist. He is the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom is what we get to see once Jesus enters the scene. The kingdom seeks to heal the sick, restore sight to the blind, and wholeness to the leper. The outcasts and the tax collector find hospitality, and the widow and the orphan find care. Jesus speaks harsh words to the lost sheep of the house of Israel or to the leaders of the Jewish faith because he believes that at that time they had allowed the empire values to co-opt their religious practices. It created a system in which religious purity was an excuse for exclusion. It was an excuse to dehumanize and to devalue the lives of those who were seen as less than less holy, less worthy. And once that happens, it is a short step towards dismissing or enslaving them. And into this void, Jesus declares that he did not come to bring peace, he came to bring a sword. In Luke's version, he actually says, I've come not to bring peace, but division. And it works rather in the same way. What, Je what is Jesus asking for here? I mean, if you read texts like this, you start to understand why some of the disciples became disillusioned when they found out that Jesus was not actually planning a political coup. What Jesus appears to be suggesting is something more akin to surgery. The sword is the carving away of what needs to be taken out. All manner of things that don't align with kingdom values, all things that devalue another person, they have to go. What he is talking about here is a threat to the empire. I mean, if Jesus were to actually get the 75% to understand their worth, the elite, the 25% would have to change their ways. This is something that Jesus is willing to go, for the, to go to the cross for, and he asks his followers to do the same. He is willing to die to suffer the shame of the cross and the violence of this capital offense, all to stand up to the empire. What is at stake in following Jesus is going to be a sense of division, right? 
because this is divisive, it's disturbing, it's political, and it's revolutionary. If you find yourself in a season where you are questioning things, or if you aren't quite sure what to think in this tumultuous time, look towards Christ. It's fair to say that Christ is almost always, no, always, going to be with the oppressed, with the marginalized, the persecuted, those who are in need of healing. If this seems overly political to you, then you should know that it is, but in no way is it partisan. The truth is, politics matter to Jesus because politics are nothing more than how we make decisions about how we share our lives together. They matter to Jesus because people matter to Jesus. And our lives to be meant, are meant to be lived in loyalty to God and in love for our neighbor. And when we look at Jesus' life and ministry, we see so much of it occurred in public spaces in ways in which would have challenged the leaders of political structures of that time, just like every prophet who spoke for God before him. I think a while ago, Christians got distracted with salvation. We picked it up and shined it up and turned it into something that we could own. And somewhere along the way, we forgot that we belonged to each other. We lost or we never completely understood that we are inextricably connected to each other. My well-being is caught up in your well-being. It's caught up in their well-being. And never before has that seemed so clear as it has during this pandemic. But we need to know that salvation isn't complete unless it calls all of God's creation to itself. The long arc of salvation bends towards justice just as it always has. In this, our very soul is at stake. Christ is calling us right now. Take up your cross, he says. Follow me. May we take these words and make them so. Would you pray with me a prayer that was written by William Coffin? May God give you the grace to never sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good and grace to remember the world is now too dangerous for anything but the truth and too small for anything but love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us grow in faith. Guide your church that we might be a holy people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for, you, for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we have created divisions you will not own. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who will work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation. Encourage organizations and individuals who care for all, forced to leave their homes. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Heal those who are sick. Feed all who are hungry. Empower all whose voices go unheard and help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of, the, of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you bring all people to yourself. We give thanks for the holy people who have gone before us. Sustain us in your mission until the day you bear us up to join the saints in light. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those that are too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you please pray with me the prayer that our Father taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
of goodness and growth. All your creation is yours. And your faithfulness is affirmed in the heavens. There are signs of your grace all around us. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might proclaim your radical love in our communities and around the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength. Amen. For the prayers, after each petition, the response is, we give you thanks and praise. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom from life with you. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh. You speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your Holy Spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of the world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Share the good news. Go in peace. Share the good news.